Hello, and welcome back to AJS 101. We're now going to begin Lesson 4, Part 1. This lesson is about managing the activities of the police. Police management involves the administrative activities of controlling, directing, coordinating police personnel activities in the service of the performance of a variety of regulatory and helping services, the apprehension of criminals and the recovery of stolen property, and crime prevention. Those are the three main areas uh, that police are involved with. Uh, the regulatory uh, services, that involves uh, directing traffic, uh, policing traffic, giving summonses, uh, perhaps issuing uh, hack violations to cab drivers that are breaking the rules. So there are a large number of regulatory services that the police uh, are involved with enforcement and also helping services. The police uh, are the only actual government service that is on the road 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Consequently, the police get called to a lot of incidents that aren't necessary criminal or law enforcement. Uh, so those helping services, car accidents, medical emergencies, lost children, uh, those are the types of non-criminal activities that uh, are part of the police helping services, the service role of police. Of course, we know about the apprehension of criminals and the recovery of stolen property. You read about that in the newspapers, you watch it in the movies and on TV, although it's a bit more glamorized uh, in, the, in the media. And of course, crime prevention. Now, cr crime prevention is important because if you can stop a crime from occurring, then all the better. But not that much time, money, and effort is put into crime prevention. Uh, a lot of it is a matter of not having enough staff and money to do that. Uh, because, frankly, uh, most money is put on the major uh, uh, regulatory and law enforcement and helping functions. But crime prevention is important, and they usually do have some police officers assigned to crime prevention details. They will go into residences and stores and do crime prevention surveys, you know, advising alarm systems, better locks, and, and things like that. All sorts of educational campaigns about how not to be a crime victim. Uh, DARE, anti-drug program in schools. So there's a lot of crime prevention programs that are also done. Let's talk about the styles of policing. Now, most police departments can be categorized as having one of three styles of policing based upon what it sees as its purpose, how it believes it should fulfill that purpose. The three styles of policing are the watchman style, the legalistic style, and the service style. Now, before we discuss these styles individually, uh, keep in mind that no one department is purely one style. Uh, one style may dominate a department, but it will still probably have aspects of the other styles also. So don't think that it's, uh, you know, this, that, or the other. Uh, most departments are a blend with one style predominating and the other two are at different levels. Uh, now, not coincidentally, the three categories of styles are closely related to the three most recent historical periods of policing. And those periods are, are first the political period, which was about 1830 to 1930. And the watchman style of policing was most prevalent in, in those years. Uh, in the political period, the police were controlled by and served the interest of political machines. America's large cities mostly on the East Coast, but, but also Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, in those days, uh, they were inhabited by large immigrant groups that often lived in their own communities and neighborhoods. And political machines ran the city. Uh, you had elected council members, I think they were called aldermen in those days, uh, and a mayor, of course, who appointed the police commission and sanitation fire commissioner, who pretty much ran the city. So. Political machines, uh, Republican, Democrat, they would uh, attempt to get their people into office uh, uh, and control the government. And the machine that controlled the government uh, had access to a lot of government resources and also could steal uh, a lot of money through bribes and graft uh, and things like that. And one way that they controlled the people was through the police. The police were... Uh, 
controllers of the population. They also were sometimes purchased through the corrupt political machine by large companies to suppress labor uh, uh, strikes and the like. Uh, and of course, the police often went out and, and ran soup kitchens to, uh, to make friends with the, uh, the people in the neighborhoods, uh, not so much because they were just friendly cops, but on election day, they wanted to round up all those people to vote for uh, the political machine that gave them their police jobs. In fact, uh, there were records back in that period of what it cost to become a cop, what it cost to become promoted to sergeant. Uh, it was an extremely corrupt system. And those cops would go out and they would collect graft or payoffs from, uh, from houses of prostitution, uh, from stores not to shut them down or write summonses to their customers. Uh, so it was a pretty corrupt system. Uh, community order maintenance was, was provided as an afterthought to serving the needs of the politicians. So not a great time in the history of policing. The next period was the Reform Era, and that was roughly 1930 to 1970. Now understand, uh, the cities were growing very rapidly uh, in the political era. Uh, they were getting packed with new immigrants, and the corrupt political machine was having a hard time delivering services. When you're corrupt, you can't clean the streets, collect the garbage, run the water system, run the police and fire systems effectively. So you can't give people services that they need and crime becomes rampant and the people get upset. So by the 1930s, the people were sufficiently upset to throw out these political machines and to bring in uh, reformers. So this is called the reform era. And the reform movement also hit police departments. Uh, the police pulled away from political control from the machines and they began to take pride in being neutral, detached, professional crime fighters. And it was during this reform era that the legalistic style of policing uh, came into being. The final and third uh, era of policing is the community policing era. Uh, and this is characterized by the service style of policing. Uh, in the community policing uh, period, the police focus on service and solving community crime-related problems uh, in partnership with the public. Now let's talk about the styles of policing themselves. Let's begin with the watchman style. The watchman style is concerned with order maintenance, which involves informal police actions to maintain the peace. So if two people are fighting, the cop doesn't go in and lock them up. He separates them, yells at them, maybe kicks one in the butt at different times and tells them to, to go away. Uh, same thing with domestic violence. You know, he responds to the house, uh, you know, tells the husband to get out and leave for a couple hours and that's the end of it. Uh, doesn't usually make arrests unless it's a serious situation. Uh, and the watchman style of policing is also a reactive style. There are two types of uh, styles, uh, reactive and proactive. Proactive, the police attempt to intervene before a crime occurs or to arrest somebody by perhaps running a decoy operation or an undercover drug buy. In a sense, the arrest is made because of act actions by the police. The reactive style, on the other hand, is when the police just wander around on a routine patrol and only react when they get a call for police assistance. So they react to the call and, and the crime that was committed and they take care of it. So that's reactive and that's the watchman style predominantly. Now the legalistic style, remember this is a style that we had in the uh, uh, reform era, this is concerned with enforcing the precise letter of the law uh, in an impersonal and impartial manner. Uh, those of you old enough to have watched the old Dragnet uh, police show uh, in the 1950s and 60s with Jack Webb, uh, this is the L.A. professional style of policing. Detached, impersonal, letter of the law, uh, everything by the book uh, when they deal with people. Uh, getting out of the police car, you know, they pull you over for, for uh, a speeding ticket. You know, license or registration, please. Please take your license out of the wallet. Please stay in the car. I'll get back to you. Uh, a, a very impersonal uh, style. Uh, impartial, 
supposedly. Um, and the idea being they didn't want to be considered uh, like they were in the political era where they were doing the bidding of politicians. Now, the legalistic style was pretty good at controlling crime. Uh, however, it doesn't do much for police community relations because they're very much like robots and they just drive around and look at you. They don't stop. They don't talk. You know, I'm, I'm generalizing now. But uh, sometimes you can fight crime by getting tips from the community. Uh, so the police suddenly weren't like that much. And they then moved into the service style. And this started to occur in, I guess, the 1980s. Uh, and the service, service style is concerned with uh, serving people rather than in strict law enforcement. And the service style uh, departments often work with social service agencies and they do a lot of crime prevention also. Uh, the service model is characterized by police community relations and community policing. So let's first talk about police community relations. Police community relations is an activity which stresses the need for the police to work together with the community. And it also has a heavy dose of public relations thrown in, uh, you know, posters, billboards, TV commercials, trying to promote the police as being nice. Uh, police community relation programs were an attempt to get the police to relate better to the community, to reduce police isolation, and help heal the wounds that divided the police from some communities uh, that occurred in 1960s conflicts. These were the riots in, in black ghetto communities, political demonstrations like those against the war in Vietnam, and various civil rights activities like uh, civil rights marches where the police often had to enforce the anti-marching laws or you don't have a permit and we're locking people up. Police community relation activities include neighborhood watch programs where the police organize the, uh, uh, the people in the community and tell them how to report suspicious behavior. Property ID programs where they etch maybe a, a number on your property. So if it's stolen and they see that number, they can, they can return the property to you. DARE, the, uh, the school anti-drug program, which is extremely uh, popular. Uh, community councils, where community members join uh, and meet uh, maybe once a month and talk with the police about different problems. Ride-alongs, where citizens get to ride in a patrol car for a, a shift with an officer to get to know the police better and understand what they do. And station house tours, where you come to the station house and uh, you, you get a tour, you see what's going on. All part of a uh, community relations, public relations program. However, the problem with police community relations was that the, they often preach to the choir. Now, preaching to the choir is, is a, a term that means you're spending your time uh, talking to people who already know what you want them to know or already like you. It's like the minister on Sunday preaching to the choir about not sinning when people in the choir probably don't sin too much because they're very religious and, they wouldn't, and they're active in the church. You know, the people who really need preaching are the ones who don't go to the church. So these programs didn't really get to the people who distrusted the police or didn't like the police. All right. Another aspect of community policing uh, and is team policing. Now, team policing involves assigning the same team of officers to an area permanently so that they get to know the area, the people, and the problems well. Uh, the team is also given wide latitude to solve problems and draw on other departmental and city resources for help. So if, uh, if, if a whole lot of drug addicts are, are hanging out, but they're living in an abandoned building, uh, one way to get rid of them is to get the building sealed up. So the cop might call the building department who would notify the landowner, that uh, the owner of the house, that if he doesn't board it up to keep them out, he'll, he'll get a summons. Team policing was very popular in the 1960s and the 1970s, and it, it's still used today. Community policing uh, brings a lot of this together. It, it has a lot of your police community relations. It has team policing, and it also has more. Uh, community policing is a new style of policing which stresses police community partnerships in identifying community problems and then solving them. So the way this works is that uh, the police meet with community members and they say, what's the problem? What's going on? And in talking to these people, they, they will then uh, try to figure out collaboratively with the public uh, 
how can we solve these problems? And then they attempt to solve the problems, and the public can participate if it's not like a dangerous police raid. Community policing also provides services for problems beyond the law enforcement areas, which of course are order and crime maintenance, uh, traditionally handled by police. Community policing makes citizens active partners in policing, and partnership is a very key uh, word in this concept. Now, community policing can involve five elements. The first would be community-based crime prevention, attention to non-emergency services, uh, and this is often related to quality of life crimes. Uh, there's a theory that, that says that if the quality of life in a neighborhood goes down, uh, there's poor services, litter and garbage all over the police, uh, abandoned buildings, and what have you, that, uh, that this causes criminals to think that they can commit crime there, and this also causes good people to leave, and it causes a de the destabil destabilization uh, and ghettoization of communities. So in community policing, police try to intervene in some of these non-emergency areas to get lots cleaned, uh, services restored better, landlords to fix up houses uh, and the like. Uh, another uh, element of community policing is increased police accountability to the public. Now what this means is, is that the public needs to know what the police are doing and how they're performing. Uh, in the old days, somebody would come to the police with a problem, the police would say, we're the professionals, we'll take care of this, thanks for letting us know, and that was it. In community policing, the public and the police collaboratively identify the problems, help find solutions, and may even jointly try to solve them. And the police are expected to gather statistics, especially crime statistics, uh, and report that, those statistics to the community to show how well or how poorly they're performing. And when the uh, police have to show how well they're performing to the public, that's called accountability. And it makes people work a lot harder if they know that whether they succeed or fail will be known to everybody. Uh, so that, that's, accountability is an important part of community policing. As is decentralized command, uh, there's two types of command structures in policing, centralized and decentralized. And in a centralized command structure, the ultimate head who controls everything is the superintendent of police or the police chief. And then below the police chief are the different commanders of the precincts, and below them the lieutenants, and below them the sergeants, and below them the cops. Uh, and generally, uh, Authority, orders, and direction comes from the top down. That's a, center, that's a centralized structure. In a decentralized structure, you give more authority to take independent action to, to the workers on the bottom, the officers and the sergeants. Because community policing requires the police to get involved in a lot of problem solving, bringing in other agencies, uh, it only works if the police officers can make those decisions and the sergeants can make those decisions without getting approval from way up the chain of command, can do it on their own. So you need a decentralized command structure for community policing. But that is resisted by people at the top. You know, if you came on the police force as a, a uniformed officer and it took you eight, nine years to become a sergeant, another five years to become a lieutenant, two more years to be captain, you worked your way up to finally get authority and power, you're not too thrilled with suddenly giving a large chunk of your power to some cop who was only hired two years ago. So uh, the higher ups in most police departments uh, are obstacles to decentralized control, control, command, but it is a necessary part of community policing. And the final element of community policing is problem-oriented policing. And this is where the police, in cooperation, partnership with the community, identify problems and their underlying causes, and these are problems which promote crime, and then remove the causes. So for an example, um, let's, take a, let's take the case of a domestic violence situation. Uh, if, a, uh, if every Friday night a husband gets drunk and beats up his wife and the police respond and they come in back week after week, they're just dealing with the problem, right? But if they identify the underlying causes, maybe the husband's an alcoholic, maybe they need family counseling, uh, and they get that type of an intervention, and they can remove the underlying problem, then, uh, then they've solved the, prob the problem. Uh, although maybe the, the underlying solution is to get the, the wife out of the house and lock up the husband for a long time, but that's another, another issue. But that's problem-oriented policing. 
find out why this is happening, and then remove the underlying cause, and then it all goes away. Uh, what are the problems with community policing? Well, not all police managers and officers accept community policing or want to do all the extra work it entails. Understand that uh, the community policing is not as cool as TV policing, where you get in your patrol car, you drive around, you give people the eye, the suspicious people, you listen maybe to talk radio while you're cruising around, you're drinking your coffee, and you respond to crime calls and, you know, and play cop. Uh, that is it was a lot more fun to many people than getting out of the car, talking to people, meeting people, going to community uh, meetings, organizing those meetings, and then guiding people through the problem identification and problem solution. Uh, it's demanding. It's not as cool uh, in, a, in a TV media policing sense. So not all police managers and officers accept community policing. They like the, the, the old style better. There's also a risk that the police, by taking on all these new responsibilities, will become the catch-all agency for problems, uh, and they may not be able to handle the job. You know, the police can't be totally responsible for cleaning up, you know, vacant lots that are filthy or boarding up buildings and, and doing you know, the, the, the large amount of underlying problem uh, removal work that community policing calls for. And when they fail to do that, maybe not even due to their own, uh, own shortcomings or failings, the public might blame them for that. Uh, also, the, speaking of the public, uh, the police will never be able to win the acceptance of some people. Uh, some people dislike police. They hate police. And no matter what the police do, they'll never win over them as partners in any kind of activities. And finally, and I already mentioned this, traditional departments will not be able to shift power to line officers, the sergeants and the cops on the street who are doing community policing, or discard the paramilitary command structure, which was necessary, which may be necessary to strip away if community policing is to succeed. Again, the chain of command, cop, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, uh, you know, deputy inspector, inspector, chief, uh, with, with communications flowing up and down and authority flowing down. Uh, that is a very rigid paramilitary structure where uh, a cop can't go to a lieutenant. He's got to go to the sergeant first to, to discuss something. That is makes it very difficult. It makes an inflexible police department and very difficult to do community policing. And even makes it difficult to do regular policing. So uh, those are some of the problems with community policing. Uh, and that's the end of Lesson 4, Part 1. So stand by for Part 2.